Satan, the devil, demons, Lucifer, sin, evil. Evil. It seems to me that most people at some points in their lives have real questions about these things, but they don't come up with very good answers. In this presentation, I want to take the Bible and look at what the Bible says, because I submit to you that the Bible is the Word of God. And within its pages, we find real answers to the questions which consciously or subconsciously we're asking. I'd like to suggest that the Bible teaches that the word Satan basically means an adversary. And that actually there's no personal Satan existing out in the cosmos. Yeah, that's right. There's no dragon with seven heads and, and ten horns that's literally out there in the cosmos. All the evil that happens in this world is permitted under God's control. And sin, yes, sin, is our biggest problem. And sin ultimately comes from within our own hearts, from within the process of temptation that is internal to us. We actually are our own Satan. And as we all say so often, we are our own worst enemy. The struggle with sin and evil is right down here on earth, right within human minds and hearts. But of course, out on the street, there are all kinds of different views and people are terribly confused. Excuse me, what do you think about Satan? Satan, wow. I never really thought much about it. Him. Isn't he like the angel that fell off the 99th floor? Anyway, I'm busy, I gotta, I gotta go. Thank you. Excuse me, what do you think about Satan? What, you said Satan? That's right, Satan. Satan. Satan, you know, I don't know. Bad things happen to good people, and bad people. Thank you for your time. Excuse me, what do you think about Satan? Huh? No idea, sorry. Thank you. What do you think about Satan? When you believe in God, you also uh, should believe in another side. But we not, do not accept the other side. It's the other side of religion. So when you believe in God, it's probably know that when you believe in the good or in the goodness, you will probably believe also the bad side. That's my opinion. Thank you. Excuse me, what do you think about Satan? Um, Satan? Well, Satan? Don't know. Sin, evil, wickedness, and something like that. Thank you. Excuse me, what do you think about Satan? It's bad. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, what do, what do you think about Satan? Oh, I think Satan should be a very wicked man or kind of dragon. And I think he shouldn't be my friend anyway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, what do you think about Satan? Um, isn't he supposed to be, what's the word, Lucifer? Thank you. Out on the street, there are all kinds of questions. But when people start thinking deeply, the classical popular understandings of Satan just, just don't add up. I mean, the standard idea is that Satan was an angel who sinned uh, and got thrown out into the Garden of Eden and led Adam and Eve into sin. And that all the evil that's on the earth is somehow 
his fault. And that he's ultimately responsible for that. God is painted as, as the good guy and Satan as his kind of opposite number. But the popular ideas of Satan are, it seems, just one dollar answers to million dollar questions. Because sin and evil, these are some of the hardest issues in the whole of human experience. People from all over the world now are coming from different backgrounds and different perspectives to the same conclusion that the standard popular views of Satan and the devil just don't add up. Janet's from New Zealand. Well, one of my questions was always, when did the devil fall? Was it before creation? Before Adam was created? Afterwards? Uh, maybe when prophesied in Revelation 12? Or even at the time of Noah, when the sons of God married the daughters of men? And Sonia's a translator from France. How can the positive effects of Satan be explained? The Bible talks about it. Men were delivered to Satan so they might learn not to blaspheme. It says so in 1 Timothy 1. Um, deliverance to Satan results in the destruction of the flesh in 1 Corinthians 5. Surely all this only makes sense if Satan merely refers to an adversary, not to some cosmic being bent on making us sin. Charles is from Nigeria. Oh, I guess most Africans believe in some Satan status figure. But my question is, um, what exactly is our defense against the devil? And uh, why would the Satan get scared of by our Bible reading? Um, may uttering the name of Christ or getting baptized? Or wearing or touching uh, the cross or making the sign of the cross? Uh, even recycling of charms as uh, many and many other things suggested by many churches. And Donald is from China. Believe in Satan is very popular in China, even among Christians. But Hebrews 2 14 says that Jesus destroyed the devil on the cross. How can the evil, how can the evil and the sins increasing in this world? And if the devil is responsible for them, and if the devil is being destroyed on the cross, how? Can the, um, how can the devil be judged as the last day if it has been, been destroyed on the cross? Very good. Now Josh is all the way from Florida in the United States. Yeah, I've really been confused why demons in relation to being fallen angels were punished by God for their sin and essentially roam around now on earth tempting us, uh, essentially torturing humanity for something that we never did. It's kind of like to me having a psychopath come out of a courtroom and we give them a gun right outside to a playground. Kevin's from Brazil. Well, uh, if God is all-powerful, that it to me um, leaves no room for a devil uh, figure uh, as his communist uh, believes it. Um, does God have, say, 15% of the power and Satan 50%? and they are battled it out up in the sky. Mm, that is nonsense for, for me. Guys from South Africa. Could or would we sin if the devil didn't exist? If not, are we not surely being punished and suffering for our sins unfairly? If we would, then to what degree is the devil responsible for our sins, seeing that we would sin anyway? Steve's an accountant from England. Many Christian writers claim that God allows Satan to work in the world, but I just don't get it. If you read the Bible, what you find is that God is the one who sends evil. It comes from the Lord. Isaiah 45 is quite clear on this point there. It says that God sends good and evil, that he sends um, the light and the darkness there. And again in Micah 1 it says God sent evil onto Jerusalem. I mean I could go on, there are lots of passages like that. John's a businessman from New Zealand. If Satan really exists as a person and has this power to tempt all human beings, then he must have enormous power and authority. 
So my question is, where does he get this power? I think he must get it from God because the Bible says all power comes from God. So did God cast Satan down to earth with all that power and authority? Which is what happened if, if Satan got cast out of heaven. Thank you. I could add many such questions. I get lots of them by email in response to the material that we have posted at realdevil.info. And I'd like, just like to read you one email. Can the devil and those angels ever repent? Does he now have free will? Did he ever have free will? Was he originally of God's nature in heaven? If Adam sinned but could repent, why could not Satan and the supposed fallen angels also repent? As Milton observed in Paradise Lost, man therefore shall find grace, the other, that, that's Satan, none. Pretty good questions, I'd say. So, what does the Bible actually say? The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And the Hebrew word shatan simply means an adversary. Now let's listen to someone who knows Biblical Hebrew explaining it. In the ancient times, among people who believe that there is a spirit that 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 is a spirit. From ancient times, there has always been the idea that there exists some kind of physical entity that is outside of us that makes us sin and is responsible for evil. They call this person Satan, but the word just means adversary. In Hebrew, the word for Satan is written like this. The word simply means an adversary. In the New Testament, it's the same. The word simply means an adversary and not any great cosmic entity. If you look in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, Chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to say plainly to his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer much from the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law. I will be put to death, but three days later I will be raised to life. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord, he said, that must never happen to you. Но он же обратился и сказал Петру, отойди от меня, сатана, ты мне собран, потому что думаешь не о том, что Божие, но о том, что человеческое. Jesus turned around and said to Peter, get away from me, Satan, you are an obstacle in my way, because these thoughts of yours don't come from God, but from man. Иисус Христос назвал Петра сатаной не в том смысле, что он конкретное лицо. When Jesus called Peter Satan, he didn't have the idea that Peter was a monster or a dragon with a long tail and with big horns. But Quite often in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the, in the New Testament, we have the idea that sin comes from inside us. And that, actually, is the great enemy, the great Satan, the great adversary. 
И от языка своего ты осудишься, и от языка оправдаешься. That's why by our thoughts and by our words that come from our thoughts we will be justified or not. In Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 7, verse 15, I don't understand what I do, for I don't do what I would like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since what I do is what I don't want to do, this shows that I agree that the law is right. So I am not really the one who does this thing, rather it is the sin that lives in me. Не какой-то сатана, кажется, живущий во плоти, кажется, в образе там человека или какого-то существа, но именно живущий грех, находящий внутри человека, он творит злое, которым so, имя дано грех. So the fault for sin is not with some external being called Satan. He talks about the sin that is within me. It's not that some person outside us makes a sin. The source of sin is within us. Таким образом, страсти, живущие в нас, ведут путям беззакония. It is the lusts within us which lead us actually into sin. И они всегда противятся воле Господа. And those thoughts are adversaries to the will of God. Sometimes the word is used to describe whole systems which are opposed to something. So in Revelation chapter 2, we read that the church in Pergamos was located where Satan's throne or seat of power was. It clearly refers to the Roman power, which had a seat of power in the, in the town of Pergamos. I mean, Satan himself, as people classically understand him, didn't have literally a throne in Pergamos and he didn't literally live there. The biggest problem we have, the biggest adversary, the nastiest Satan, is our own sinful tendencies. Now, let's get it clear. Sin comes from within. And I would like to read to you from Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, uh, we'll start at verse, verse 15. There's nothing from outside the man that going into him can defile him. But the things which proceed out of the man are those that defile the man. Whatever from without goes into the man, it cannot defile him, because it doesn't go into his heart but into his belly. That which proceeds out of the man is what defiles the man, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, wickedness, deceit, pride, foolishness, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. That was reading Mark 7 from 15 up to 23. And let's just go further to James. James chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at James chapter 1 from verses 13 down to 15. Each man is tempted when he is dragged away by his own own lust, his own lust, and enticed. Then the lust, when it has conceived, carries sin, and the sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I work a lot with people battling addictions. Here in Latvia, alcoholism is really a big problem. So many are trapped within those addictions by a strong belief that they are controlled by forces from outside themselves. Basically, Satan. Recognising that actually we are the problem. That the human mind can be transformed and that we must take responsibility, 100% responsibility for our sins. This has been the key to success in many spiritual battles that I have observed. 
Now, this is where theology, if you like doctrine, Bible teaching, has a radical power in practice. It is intended for the transformation of human lives, human minds, human thinking in practice. That's why it does matter what we believe, because Bible doctrine affects our lives. That's why it's important to get it right. It's rather like we are, in that sense, what we, what we eat. A person is what they believe. People who've rejected the common idea of Satan have really found great freedom. Uh, Josh, what did it mean for you in practice to find the truth about Satan? Yeah, I think for me it was the matter of really having choice, real choice. Um, the, the fact that there was no longer this super being that had power over me to tempt me and what I wanted to do. Uh, so it really brought into my life responsibility and from that free will. Right. Real free will. You know, this is a, a ladder to, to reach the stars, really. Real freedom. Now, John, you've written and spoken a lot about forgiveness. How has your understanding of Satan affected your, your view of, of forgiveness? It, it's made a big difference, actually. Um, if we allow ourselves to believe that the devil made me do it, we're not really taking responsibility for our own actions and, and frankly, the damage we do to others. And also, the other way around, um, if we're going to really forgive people, we need to face what they did, not just excuse them. Mm -hmm. So, if we allow ourselves to say, well, the devil made him do that to me, it's, it's just so much harder to forgive. We need to forgive them, um, face what they did, forgive them. I think we just leave this orthodox view of Satan right out of it. Donald, from a Chinese perspective, uh, what are your thoughts? Mm, I thought a lot about all this. It seems to me that we demonize people very easily. We transfer our sin onto them. Iran called America the great Satan. People seem to draw horns and tails on people. But people are only people, no more and no less. By facing up to the fact that sin is our fault, our fault as an individual, as a society, we get far closer to the realities, we can deal with people for who they are and how they really act, without assuming they are just some puppies being called Satan. Very interesting. Janet, Penny for your thoughts. Well, I liked verse James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Um, I find it quite a problem though if we're wrestling a literal beast and he runs away every time we put up a fight. The point is, resist the sin within us and then victory comes a lot easier. Yeah. And finally, Charles. I think uh, the belief in a person of Satan is so popular because uh, it takes away the focus from our own struggle. And uh, in our innermost uh, nature, it makes us look better and others worse. In fact, actually, I would say that um, it makes us as humans look better than we are. And it excuses us from the mess we have made in this earth. Thank you very much. I've done quite a bit of work with my friend Yuris, and I'd like to ask him to just tell us a little bit of his spiritual story. Да, была такая ситуация, что раньше я верил дьяволу. Yes, there was the situation that earlier I believed in a, a personal devil. Я думал, что если меня плохо, это не я виноват, а дьявол. I thought that if I did anything bad, it wasn't really my guilt, it was the devil's. Ну, пришло Сознание у меня такое, и я понял, что нет такого дьявола. But over time, I came to understand that really there is no devil in that sense. Все у нас внутри, все у нас внутри, мы сами себе контролируем. 
came to realize that sin comes from inside us and we've got to control ourselves within. I didn't have a very good life. But when I finally understood that everything was only in my hands in that sense, Меня жизнь изменилась на 180. My life improved and turned around by 180 degrees. Появилась работа. I found work. Друзья. Friends. И, конечно, такая жизнь, как такая, какая каждый человек мечтал об этом. I came to find myself which is maybe every person's dream. The main lesson for me in this issue was to take complete responsibility for my own actions and not to blame any being like Satan. Life's now great. So, I mean, one of the biggest problems I find with the Satan thing is that it, it minimizes sin. I, I mean, I, I found so many people who've got addiction problems who are really convinced they can't get above alcohol or drugs because they're under Satan's control. And when you actually tell them that, look, it's you, the real enemy is you, they find this very uh, attractive, very kind of helpful um, in taking responsibility. And we've had a number of cases here where people have really changed their lives, I would say, because of their understanding of, of Satan. You think they really are shifting responsibility to Satan then? It's... Yes, so they tell me. Yeah. So they, they, they think that it's actually, you know, all their... It's not quite their fault, it's Satan's fault. But once they realize there is no Satan, the Satan is me, yes. then it changes. So I think doctrine is... Putting that experience in more biblical terms, I'd like to think a bit about the implications of one Bible verse. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Since then the children, that's us, are sharers in flesh and blood. Jesus also himself, in like manner, partook of the same nature, so that through his death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver all those who through fear of death, that's humanity, all those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus had our nature and died in order to destroy the devil. Romans 8 verse 3. Romans 8 verse 3. Let's have a look over there. Romans 8 verse 3 says that God, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man, that is, in our human nature, condemned sin in sinful man. This shows that the devil and the sinful tendencies that we naturally have are effectively the same. The verse in Hebrews chapter 2 says that the devil has the power of death. But Romans 6 verse 23, and very often in the Bible, we read that sin has the power of death. But Hebrews 2 said the devil is what's got the power of death. So the devil and sin are in that sense in parallel. Sin in the end, is our greatest accuser. Your sin is your greatest accuser. My sin is my greatest accuser. My greatest enemy, my greatest adversary, my greatest enemy. First of John chapter 3, let's have a look over there towards the end of the New Testament. First of John uh, chapter 3, this makes the same, the same kind of parallel between sin and the devil. 
First of John, uh, chapter 3. For, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Let's just go on to verse 5 in the same chapter. Jesus was manifested to take away our sins. But it's just said he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. He was manifested to take away our sins. So our sins are the works done by the devil. But where does sin come from? We already saw from the Bible, from within us. And we have to take complete responsibility for, for that. Actually, you know all this, really, from your own experience, if you're honest. If we truly believe and perceive that, in fact, the devil and its power have been fully vanquished in Jesus, in his death, as the Bible teaches... If we survey the cross of Jesus and see there the power of sin, the power of the devil, finally slaughtered, finally dead in the perfect mind of the Lord Jesus as he hung there. And if we realise that that ultimate victory of victories has been shared with all of us who are baptised into him, the source, the, the root cause of so much neurosis and, and, and dysfunction and, and fear is revealed to us as powerless. No fear of even death itself, ultimately. We may fear the process, but not ultimately. No fear even of the ultimate consequence of sin, which is death. Because sin has been conquered in Jesus and we are in him if we are properly baptised into him. I used to think that we were pretty much alone in our view of Satan, but I found that there's many, many people, thinkers, writers, who have come to the same conclusion. Now, we don't need to get our support for truth or an idea just from the fact that many other respectable people think the same. I hope that if, I came, that if it came to it, and that if it came to it for you, we would stand with our backs to the world, if need be, if we felt that the Bible was behind a belief that we held. But all the same, on a, on a kind of uh, human level, it's very interesting to find, reading around the subject, that there's so many people who have come to the same conclusion. Take a very popular Christian author, Paul Turnier. I think I've got all of Paul Turnier's books somewhere on my bookshelves, and I've read all of them. In nearly all these books, he's coming out with the same idea, that the real struggle within the human mind is the ultimate struggle between sin and righteousness, between light and darkness. Paul Turnier is a fantastically popular writer, and it's a big theme in all his books. And there's one particular book that he wrote that in uh, an English translation is called The Violence Within. Rather similar to another very popular writer, the French sociologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, he came to the same conclusions in a book of his called The Savage Mind, that the real problem is our own mind, not some being outside us, but the struggle is within, and we must take complete responsibility for that struggle. My, my book, The Real Devil, which uh, you can get free from realdevil.info, this book has got a few hundred footnotes. And those footnotes are generally two studies that have come to the same conclusions from theologians, psychologists, professionals, individuals. We are not alone in this rejection of Satan's existence as a personal being. Another book. The Reality of the Devil evil in man. A lot of thinkers have come to the same conclusion. 
But let me say again, whether we stand with our backs to the world doesn't make any difference. If that's what the Bible teaches, so be it. But I'm just saying that, humanly speaking, you know what I'm saying, it's a comfort that actually other people have figured the same. So, summing up, I'd say this, that the devil remains an unexamined assumption in the minds of very many Christian people and religious people generally. The presence of unexamined assumptions in our hearts and, and in our lives and in our thinking and our worldviews should be a red flag to us. Why not examine it? And we live in an age where every paradigm seems to be examined, uh, every tradition is overturned, etc. So have a look at this subject for yourself. Because it's so important that we take responsibility for our behaviour. And to realise that actually the struggle that is within us has ultimately been won because the Lord Jesus, in his death, because he had our nature, destroyed the devil who has the power of death. Facing up to the fact that we are serious sinners is not a pleasant thing. We'd rather that that was not the case. We don't like ultimately taking responsibility. But this is the way to true freedom. The fact that the Lord Jesus Christ shared our nature and overcame sin as our representative and we can identify with him by baptism, this is the good news of the Gospel. It's so much easier to simply demonise a few wicked people and to blame everything on other people. Solzhenitsyn was a guy who both experienced evil and thought about it, I think, far more than, than many people. And there is a quote of his from the Gulag Archipelago that I would like to share with you. And I have it on, on my laptop. It goes like this in, in English translation. If only it were all so simple. If only it were necessary, only to separate evil people from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? If now, towards the end of our presentation, you're thinking, yeah, interesting, and you go off and have a coffee and get something out of the fridge and forget about it, I will have failed. So don't leave it there, please. We're talking here in deadly earnest about the very essence of Christianity and spirituality, which is to be spiritually minded, to overcome temptation, to have the mind of Christ. Have a serious read through the real devil. It's there at realdevil.info. You can get the PDF. You can order the book for free. And don't give yourself any rest until you've been properly baptised into Jesus, so that his victory over sin and death becomes yours. And of course, you will have questions, doubts, unease, and I understand that. Pray about it and drop us an email, info at carelinks.net. Or if you want to have it out with me personally, I'm Duncan Heaster, and my personal email is dh at heaster.org. God bless you. Just don't, don't.